Thank you. Just to get a feel for the audience, um, let's do a really quick survey. How many people here? So this is going to be an additive survey. Once you raise your hand, keep it up until you, you, a question comes that uh, you have to answer no to. And if you don't raise your hand on the first question, you can't raise your hand. So how many people have built a predictive model in the last six months? How many was for commercial use? Ah, all right. And how many of those are familiar with random forests? All right, now the tough one. How many are familiar with AdaBoost? Oh, it's the same three people over and over. Um, how, many, how many of you are familiar with XGBoost? All right, so, so uh, we got some good cross-section here. Um, for those who already been mentioned, for those not familiar uh, with Merkle, we're part of a global conglomerate, but our coolest and most fun and best-looking office is seven blocks from here, up, up the road. And uh, as was mentioned, we're, we're building a data science team here because we really believe in this community. And this community is going to grow to be one of, the, uh, um, one of the better data science communities in the country. So what am I going to go through? I'm going to go through uh, what is a look-alike model. Look-alike model is probably the most common actual predictive model in advertising. They're very, very common. Um, explain a little bit about what that is. Uh, then explain what XG Boost is and why some people, a lot of people, are so excited about it. Um, look at the underpinnings of of the algorithm. <clears throat> then go over the data set that we used. We used five different data sets to evaluate it, and we'll talk about the data sets and what kind of predictor variables, what kind of X variables we used. And then lastly, go over the results. And as as is often the case in. Uh, in the, in the new algorithms coming out in data science. It's not just the accuracy of the result. It's not just the area under the curve. It's which combination of hyperparameters led you to that. So we'll spend a bunch of time on the hyperparameters, because um, with a lot of algorithms, including XGBoost, it's, it's the hyperparameters that are the important part. So what is the look-alike model? It's very simple. Uh, given a population of people, we do advertising, so we're interested in people. Given a population of people, what um, and, and a proper subset, then score everybody who's not in the proper subset on their likelihood or their similarity to be in the set. <clears throat> now, if we were scoring individuals one at a time, then this would be a similarity problem, and you could use Chicard similarity or cosine or uh, or chi-square similarity. But what we're doing in advertising is always big populations, not, not one person at a time, but comparing one population to another population. So we just changed it into a classification problem. What's your, what's your likelihood of being in this class? A couple simple examples in advertising, very fairly simple. The, um, look at everybody in the, mid, in the mid-Atlantic region who bought lawn products from Lowe's last spring. Uh, we don't want to advertise to those people again because lawnmowers usually last more than one year. So, um, but we want to go find another million similar people. So the population is every adult in the mid-Atlantic region. The subset is people who bought uh, lawn equipment last year. And now go find a million more similar people. A couple other quick examples is given <clears throat> we had a customer um, uh, gave us 10 million of their best customers and said, go find more. Usually, uh, they break it down to the top decile or people that have made a major purchase recently. Um, so given half a million customers, go find 5 million similar prospects. Um, and then in direct response, uh, you can break it down to who looked at the ad and bought something or who clicked on the ad and bought something or who looked at the ad and visited the site within two weeks all kinds of different combinations of deciding uh, who the target population is. But then usually the base population is just the whole United States, uh, tracking, tracking everybody in the United States, every adult. Um, there's laws against uh, uh, advertising and targeting directly to children. <clears throat> so XGBoost, XGBoost is, um, the nice thing about the open source community is you get these really long threads of an algorithm improving. And you could argue that XGBoost uh, is, is, has been improving for more than 10 years because it came out of the, uh, the random forest uh, lineage. 
So <clears throat> it's an iterative boosting algorithm. So you make a whole bunch of little itty bitty decision trees and they all get together and vote and decide what the answer is. Uh, random forest was the first one in this, in this line. It was very simple, just randomly picked a bunch of different, um, a bunch of different uh, uh, X variables to go after and then built trees. The problem, the trees became very highly correlated. So there wasn't very much new information from the 100th tree to the 101st tree. Um, but it was good at not overfitting because you got a whole bunch of really dumb little models and just added a whole bunch of models together. Uh, and then Adaboost came along and started adding cross-validation to it to, uh, to try to get the correlation, to try to get less redundancy between the 100th tree and the 101st tree. Um, but there was still a problem. It's, they, they, they were still too highly correlated. So now XGBoost comes along and adds gradient descent on top of that uh, and really improved um, the accuracy. So the way it works at a very high level, like I said, is you take a whole bunch of really shallow trees, um, pick a subset of the Xs. So you, any given tree is not looking at all the predictors. It's looking at a subset of the predictors. You build a shallow tree. You prune the tree. One of the, one of the good ways to prevent overfitting with these decision tree ensembles is you build a symmetric tree, and then you go bottom up to prune the tree, getting rid of, um, uh, getting rid of branches that don't add a lot of information. And then the gradient descent part is you reweight re the errors. So uh, if you get the prediction right, then you know the, you have enough trees to predict that row correctly. So now you got to build some trees that can predict the ones you got wrong. So you reweight the observations and start building more models, and you can drill into the errors very very quickly. And you can repeat this thousands of times. Um, and the final score is just the sum of the, uh, the, the scores of the tree. So here's an example from um, uh, Tai Quinn Chin's um, paper. He's the one that came up with XGBoost. Uh, he's out of the University of um, Washington. And it's two simple trees, one tree that's only uh, two levels deep. And the leaf nodes are the score for that person. So you go down the decision tree, find out where you are. The leaf node gives you the score. You do that for all the different trees, hundreds of trees, thousands of trees, and you add up the scores. Uh, now, because XGBoost is an open source algorithm, it's got this immense flexibility on what your loss function and what your regularization is. So for classification, you can, you can tell it to use, um, you can just use uh, area under the curve, for, uh, for multi-class, you can use uh, log loss, uh, mean squared error for regression or continuous problems. There's, there's a lot of different choices you can configure it for what your, um, your loss function is going to be. And then for regularization, we already mentioned it prunes the trees bottom up, which is a, a, a special way of handling regularization. But then the penalty function uh, for regularization uh, is uh, the number of leaves plus the, the default for the, uh, for the um, classifier, the, the default is number of leaves plus half the sum of the square of the scores. So just like ridge regression or lasso regression, if you've used those, we're forcing down the number of coefficients, and we're forcing down the magnitude of the coefficients. So those two together uh, uh, get you a more stable model. And again, just like almost everything in the open source, there's lots of choices for your regularization. If you don't want to use um, number, of, number of leaves plus half the sum of the square of the scores, uh, you, can add, you can add other ones. So <clears throat> the really exciting part about XGBoost is it only has three hyperparameters. If you've used some of the new algorithms uh, or if you've played with uh, deep learning, um, I don't think anybody knows how many hyperparameters are in deep learning. but. Uh, um, the, uh, there's only three hyperparameters, so you can, get a, you can get a decent model pretty quickly. There's only three things you have to decide. Uh, how many trees, which means how many iterations you go through, right? You're randomly picking Xs, building a tree, repeat, build another tree, add up the scores. How many trees do you want to look at? 
the max depth of the tree. This is, is another way of uh, uh, controlling overfitting. So how, how many levels in each tree. And then the learning rate, which is how fast you descend down the gradient uh, when, you, when you go after those errors. And um, you know, if you look at all, if you look at a bunch of different combinations of this, it might seem like it's 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 way too many. But for a lot of algorithms, three hyperparameters is really low. There's there's some that have far more hyperparameters. So this is kind of nice. Um, what the learning rate does is, like I said, it dampens the uh, gradient descent. So when you reweight the uh, the errors and build another tree. <laughs> Uh, and you, you start zeroing in on, on the, the errors from the previous trees, <clears throat> the learning rate basically controls how fast you use that knowledge. And this is one of the best ways for controlling overfitting. If, if, the, if the learning rate is too high, you can overfit on the errors really, really quickly. You can overfit on the outliers, right? Imagine a thousand trees, each uh, depth 10. I mean, there's there's plenty of computation power there to overfit on almost on most data sets. Um, so the the learning rate just dampens the vote of the success successive trees as it moves down the uh, the gradient. These are some example trees from the problem we're going to be talking about here. It's uh, um, fairly shallow, fairly correlated. You can see they're both level four. They, they were symmetric before they got pruned. So they, they were symmetric trees, and then the algorithm prunes them bottom up to get rid of leaves and branches that don't add enough information, right? Because there's that penalty function in regularization. The bigger the coefficients, the more leaves you have. Uh, there's a penalty for that. So the trees were pruned. They're both level four. They both have the same split for the first, second, and fourth level. But there is a difference. They used a different variable in uh, the third level. And, and I mean, it took a long time for people to believe these really dumb ensembles would get decent models, because it's a pretty tiny difference. But you repeat this a 1,000 times, and uh, uh, you get pretty, pretty good models that are, um, uh, that are very difficult to overfit. And like, yeah, like I said, the bottom-up pruning is, is another way they prevent overfitting. So the data set we used. <coughs> Hopefully none of you are surprised that there's a lot of data about you out in the world. Um, we have 3,000 pieces of data, and 3,000 columns, 3,000 uh, continuous variables on every adult in the United States. And we have whole teams that update that quite regularly. Uh, and then we have a subset of that called the binary um, attributes that we use. Uh, online and it's 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 500 yes no variables, um, and it's it's things like age and gender. Uh, so for age, we just bin it into 13 bins, and then you have a, uh, a yes no variable for each one of those. Um, household, where you live, uh, DMA, uh, income, household income, what car you drive, what you're interested in. I think there's 75 interest variables. Every, everything from uh, cats and dogs to uh, video games. Um, I double checked this weekend. There's nothing about college basketball in there, though, so I'm sorry about that. Um, I looked up this morning what are the most common attributes in the database. The most common attribute is likes to shop at malls. Uh, the second most common is use the inter uses the internet. I imagine that was a useful variable once. Uh, it's really close to 100 now, 100%. The rarest variable is um, owns an Austin automobile. I have no idea what an Austin is, but uh, evidently there's a car called Austin. And then uh, Maybach is the second one. And then the third rarest is uh, occupation as a landscape architect. So. <laughs> There's some really obscure stuff in there. Uh, so the, the data sets we used, we went to, we went to um, uh, four of our clients, five of our clients, pulled together data sets of people they wanted to model, campaigns they wanted to do. And like I said on the earlier slide, it's, it's either things like uh, give me 500 of your best customers or um, 
uh, or, or 500,000 of your best customers, or just give me all your customers, and, and we model that out. But we've got two from financial services, one from video entertainment, one from consumer electronics, and one from apparel. So when I do studies like this, it's really important to try to get a cross-section of the industry. Things that work in financial services very well may not work in, in apparel or in entertainment. So get a cross-section. We built the models. Um, you can see the results here. I like to give the bottom line up front. So the optimal, for all these models, the optimal was 500 trees. So we went through that iteration 500 times. Um, the depth of the tree was very shallow, as you would expect, uh, three to four uh, levels. The learning rate was 0.3. And then the area under the curve was really excellent. It found, you know, again, we were, we were uh, doing this on the entire US population. We weren't restricting it to, um, you know, just people who, who have lawns and live in the Mid-Atlantic region. It was taking people from the audience of interest and applying it to the whole United States. And to be honest, in our industry, these, these area end of the curve scores are really good. And uh, this was almost completely automatic once we figured out the hyperparameters. Um, it was a classification problem, so we did, uh, we did um, a balanced sample like you usually do. Uh, and like I said, these are, these are pretty darn good scores. So <clears throat> to the hyperparameters, the, the key part of the hyperparameters is deciding which of these combinations to use um, or building a, a layer on top of the algorithm that, that tries to stop it when it starts going bad. So but what we did is we, we analyzed a cross-section of all these parameters. Um, and in the, in the libraries, you can do grid search on this where you can just give it a list of hyperparameters and it looks at every combination and then just comes back to you with a chart and says, here's the best one. But I like to look at these things in scatter plots because often in these cases, especially with the gradient descent algorithms, <clears throat> the best parameter might take 15 times longer to train than, than the second best, and it only adds one one thousandth of an area under the curve. So I like, I like to do scatter plots on these to, to really see what's going on. So the, um, uh, the horizontal axis is training time, and most of these are under a minute at the first bar. So like this first bar here is less than a minute. Um, this one was the longest at uh, 200 seconds. And then um, the vertical axis is area end of the curve. So you can see for the number of trees, the blue one, 100 trees, <clears throat> trains very fast, uh, gets decent accuracy quite quickly. These data, you know, even though we have 500 variables, turns out people aren't that different. They like to think they're different, but they're, they're really not all that different. So we get decent models with just 100 trees. But 100 trees certainly wasn't the best model. And if you eyeball it, there's a little bit of a, a little bit of an elbow up there. And somewhere around 500 trees is the best trade-off for, um, for accuracy versus uh, um, training time, for us, anyway. Um, we're always concerned with training time because there are situations where we have to build 10,000 of these rather, relatively quickly. So um, uh, training time is always a trade-off. So this is for tree depth, uh, about 500 tree, or number of trees, 500 trees was the best yield across all five of these uh, data sets. The next was the depth. We looked at uh, depths one through five. Depth, depth one is sometimes called a stump. It's just a single variable with a split. And uh, it's amazing how many times um, single, single splits work really well, as long as you have 1,000 trees. Uh, but anyway, so. Um, you look at these scatter plots and you really can't see much. The depth is not one of the strong governing principles of, of this data set. So if you squint and you kind of look for the elbow in the upper left, somewhere, somewhere around four, you get decent models. So depth four is good enough. And <clears throat> if you've worked with these kinds of algorithms for a while, you know that it's, uh, there's not much chance of overfitting with, with five trees uh, on, on these kinds of data sets where we have you know, 260 million people and 500 variables. And then the learning rate, this is the important one. Learning rate is uh, how fast uh, you go down the gradient descent, how much you dampen the learning of tree 100 versus tree 101 versus tree 102. Uh, and this um, becomes pretty clear, right? You can see on the first one, you can see 
<coughs> a learning rate of 0 0.001, it's going to take that thing a long time to get a good model. It'll get a good model, right? It's, it's an additive, it's an additive uh, algorithm. So it'll get a good model, but it's going to take it a long time. It's, it's gradually moving up uh, the gradient or down the gradient. Um, <coughs> the, uh, and uh, for us, the, for these uh, data sets, uh, 0.3 was fine. 0.3 is higher than you usually get in these problems. Um, but again, people are not that different they, than, than they think. So if there is a good match for the population, you tend to find it fairly quickly. So 0.3 learning rate was the best. Um, it, it gets to the, that upper left elbow uh, the quickest. Um, so the other important thing to know about learning rate is you absolutely can overfit on these things. And um, there's an old saying in data science, or uh, if you want to see around the corner, just go around the corner and look. So theoretically, learning rate of one would be a bad idea. So let's go prove that. Ran learning rate of one, everything from 0.1 to one. And you can see <clears throat> this is like the true definition of, of overfitting for, tr for uh, trees of depth five after the first or second model it gets worse, it gets worse fast. So um, these gradient descent algorithms certainly overfit and that's why you need the uh, either a early exit detection or, or dampen it with a learning rate. Uh, we also looked at how big the data sets need to be because like I said, our data set is, is 300 or 260 million people. So sometimes the data set can be arbitrarily big, but again, we're always concerned about uh, training time because sometimes we have to do 10,000 of these quickly. So. <clears throat> Somewhere around 500,000 observations is plenty good. And then the other really nice thing about uh, that's often uh, required in advertising is you have to have a understandable model. Not a completely transparent model, but you have to be able to explain what it found. And with trees, it's very easy to run over the trees when you're done and build up um, a variable importance. So every, everyone comes out with a, a list of variable importance. Um, this is the uh, video entertainment audience, and being single was the most important variable, followed by being really old. Um, and these are just measuring the gain that that variable provides. It's not measuring the correlation between a yes on that variable and the audience. So <clears throat> this doesn't tell you anything about whether it's better to be single or not single if you're targeting this audience. You have to go back and look that up through descriptive statistics. But this tells you which variables generated uh, uh, the predictive power. Um, this is rich people who have money in money markets, which means they have no idea how to invest. Those tend to be really good customers for certain kinds of financial um, companies. Uh, net worth above 150,000. And then this is our favorite. We had to model this three times because we couldn't believe it. Um, does anybody here own a Land Rover? I gave a part of this talk once in the West Coast and like 80% of the people raised their hand. And I, said, <laughs> I said, please sign up over here. I know someone who wants to talk to you. Um, so th these are these lifestyle variables, right? You probably know people who own BMWs or Land Rovers. It's a social marker. It's a pretty powerful social marker. Someone who, who drives a Ford F50 versus a, a BMW 700. It's a, it's a pretty clear explanation of their personality. Um, so <clears throat> so XGBoost, it's, it's the third generation uh, boosting algorithm. It's got parity in Python and R, which is really important to us. We don't want to dictate which, uh, which algorithm you use. Um, and so we want everything to work in Python and R. Uh, it's 100% automatic. Once you pick the hyperparameters, boom, goes and builds the model. Two minutes for a lot of these. Really good accuracy. And now our challenge is scoring. So if anybody has any experience scoring XGBoost with 30 billion rows, I will buy you a drink or 10 if you tell me how you do it. So getting, get, getting the training to scale is pretty easy. Getting the scoring to scale is a big challenge for us right now. Uh, and if you want to learn more, um, there's some wonderful 
I mean, th there's free stuff on YouTube like you wouldn't believe. Really good lectures on YouTube about this stuff, including the guy who wrote the R package. And then, of course, the, uh, the original paper is available a lot of places on the web. Thank you very much.